The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited, and of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. My hi my, this is Gone by Lunchtime, the greatest politics podcast the spinoff has ever produced. My name is Toby Manhire, and over there is Annabelle Lee. Hello, Annabelle. Yeah. Uh, ben Thomas, uh, you're back from Wellington. I'm back. You were stuck there again for a few days. Should we go over all that territory <laughs> again? <laughs> um, no, the, the, the whole thing is broadly depressing. We can, br- we can bring back my, um, my time in Wellington when we're talking about the sponsor. And talking I'm, about for I'm for, glad you raised the sponsor, um, which is Life Direct. Um, nice. They they sponsor this podcast, Gone by Lunchtime. They also sponsor the politics section. And they generally make you feel a lot better about the inevitability of death, don't they, Ben? Yes. Whenever I'm visiting our nation's capital and looking forward to death's sweet embrace, I think maybe I should provide for those left behind. You can um, use that little Woodgy doodacky what's it on the side of any politics post and find out. How much? Yeah, you know, like good How much cheap you life insurance. Your partner. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's covered. I'm not <laughs> sure homicide is covered by the. Just a point of clarification. Well, obviously, you wouldn't kill them yourself. You just arrange for someone else to do it. Again, I'm not sure that's strictly covered. Oh. Um, contract killing. I'm not sure it's strictly covered by. Check it out. I'm sure the rules are probably. It's worth. On there. It's just worth. It's just a little, little legal type. advisor. It's worth going through the notes. Um, follow us and like us on the um, podcasting platform of your choice. I was looking, Ben. Annabelle, earlier today at iTunes to see if anyone had left any uh, comments denouncing Ben for his um, hate speech against Wellington. And you'll be pleased to hear, I'm just going to find this on my computer, I discovered there's something else called Gone by Lunchtime, <coughs> excuse me, and it's by a, a, a singer-songwriter called Live Bait. I'm going to play it to you now. I'm going to just lift up my computer to the thing. Um, here we go. There's a rabbit who's running from the hunter's gun And he'll be gone by lunchtime what do you think? It reminds me of the sort of musical yes, acts they used to have at the campaign launches the for the Alliance, sort of, back <laughs> in 1993. <laughs> do you think that, that suits this podcast as a new new theme? Yeah, it's got a nice nostalgic feel. I, I think that our podcast should be rebranded Gone by Lunchtime-esque. Mm. Mm. Um, I see what you did there, Ben. <laughs> Just like to note that that now has 17 views on YouTube. Gone by lunchtime by the band Live Bait. Um, yes, we, we could, it could be described as MNMS, which takes us effortlessly into the matter of the court case um, in Wellington, the High Court between Eminem and his people. We're, we're very the late to this. Party. Well, there's, there's been 10 days of jokes about Eminem lyrics and, all been used and to references. Out. Yeah, we're, this is, our, our contribution is probably the latest to any kind of hip-hop beef since Meek Mill finally got his diss track against Drake out. Mm, that's good. I don't, not, not sure I understand M- it. Millennials, but. please my like daughter, and subscribe. My, <laughs> my daughter would have loved that joke. Um, so I've, I've, but, but I've, I've prepared one. Oh, he's you got know, another one. Good. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go on. <laughs> we, we need to go deep into the unloved early Eminem tracks uh, to, to, to make the analogy. This is what happens when bad meets evil. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm done now. You guys will have to take it from here. That I was, think the whole book would just shut it down now. That was, that was um, 
There's, what can, where do we go from here? Uh, like, you just can't. It's been a, lo- a lot of awesome. court cases they have there. We've got <laughs> the m M&M against the National Party. We've got Chester Burroughs uh, versus um, the, uh, dildo. the dildo. And um, for the kind of the most deja vu nightmare of all, Colin Craig versus um, Cam Slater in the Auckland High Court. He's, Colin Craig is just reading out the same evidence again. He's just reading out the letters that he wrote to, to Rachel McGregor about how he didn't intend to kiss her, not that he didn't want to. I mean, it's it's almost like a, it's like a, it gives me terrible flashbacks. It's sort of like if there was a high court case. To your own uh, teenage yeah, years? I, I, yeah, it, it reminds me of, you know, hanging out with my teenage friends playing Magic the Gathering, talking about how we totally could have patched that girl. <laughs> Had we wanted, and I just think it's an incredibly unedifying display. I, <laughs> it also makes me throw up in my mouth a bit. Did did any of the politicians you took care of like ever send you letters like that? <laughs> um, no, it was it was a very different relationship. Um, it's yeah, it's it, it's interesting. You know, you never really know how you never other got people, like smiley face emoji. Yeah, like how that. other people in your position are, are, are conducting their jobs, and it it turns out that the press secretary role for Colin Craig was very very different from that for the attorney general. And um, Slater, who's counter suing Craig, is asking for sixteen million four hundred thousand and twenty dollars or something. I, I think I think Slater is suing Craig, and Craig is counter suing Slater. Oh, really? Yeah, um, I, th- I think Slater was buoyed by the... I think you're wrong. But anyway. Really? I mean... We'll look it up later. It all gets washed. It all comes up. They're all, washed. They're, everyone's suing each other is the point. But Slater but, is counter-suing, eh? I think we, we have some dispute on the timing, but... One of them is suing <laughs> the other one, and the other one is suing okay. the other one back. I thought it was Cam counter-suing, but okay. Yeah, so Ka- Cameron Slater has named... Uh, so this, of course, goes back to the... Um, Colin Craig believed that allegations were made about his relationship with Rachel McGregor and his role in the Conservative Party, so he sent out 1.6 million self-published leaflets um, from a range of contributors that all turned out in the end to be Colin Craig. (laughs) Mr. X. (laughs) Mr. X, the anonymous interviewer, the um, omniscient narrator. He later said that these were well-known literary (laughs) devices rather than any attempt to to deceive the electorate. Mm. Um, And now, yeah, Cameron Slater, um, and and this made certain allegations that Cameron Slater was involved in dirty politics. Cameron Slater, of course, a well-known blogger and court-recognised media outlet. Um, will be running the defence of qualified privilege, um, which Andrew Little recently used mm. in his also farcical um, defence against the, Hagen. um, the Hagemans. Wasn't necessarily a farcical defence, a farcical episode oh, sorry, altogether. The, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes, say, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the surreal circumstances. Mm. Um, I would think that Slater would probably get away with that defence here. Um, I don't think that in his countersuit that he will get $16 million from Colin Craig, um, which is the sum that he's nominated um, as the damages uh, for his, his feelings and the loss of reputation that he suffered. Just can't put a price on feelings. <laughs> so true. Another, another billion-dollar thought from Annabelle Lee. Um, meanwhile, Annabelle, in the um, hurly-burly of politics proper, we've got um, Willie Jackson has been centre stage over the release of the Labour Party list for the September election, which was um, discussed by the executive what to do till over the weekend. It was meant to be published on the Monday. Then all of a sudden it wasn't being published, wasn't being published. Willie Jackson was flying down to Wellington to, according to headlines, have it out with Labour leadership. And then it got published the next day with what was was it was it no Marty in the first fifteen Willie at twenty first uh, and Kitty Tapu at, at twenty and Willow Jean Prime at Kitty Allen yeah Kitty Tapu Allen Kitty yeah. Tapu Allen yeah yeah she's just calling herself Kitty Allen now I don't know it's, 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 it's make it easier for people like Ben and me and and Toby <laughs> um, <clears throat> so whew, what was that all about? Well, Willie says that he didn't, um, that the list wasn't postponed because of him and that he is in a sookie bubba as described by 
um, Paddy Gower, but he did say that um, that he was disappointed that there were no Māori in the first 15, and mm. I think a lot of other Māori were as well, both inside and outside of the party, um, as you would expect in this day and age. And if you go back and you look at um, Labour's list since 1996, this does appear to have the lowest ranking number of um, Māori MPs. There's usually always been at least ten, uh, two in the top ten, mm. um, sometimes three in the top 15. So we've, it's an understandable response, I would have we've, thought. We've talked before about the um, decision by the incumbent Labour Party, excuse me, MPs and the Māori electorates to withdraw from the list. Mm. And my understanding is that the quid pro quo was that there would be Māori list candidates promoted up to the very top of that list. Mm. And I think the, 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 the Willie's argument is that it wasn't necessarily so much about him as it was about the absence of those people up there. That's right. And, I mean, we had Calvin Davis on last month before the list was... Um, Decided, and he asked him, you know, do you think there'll be two in the top ten? And he said, mm. well, hopefully yes. And mm. you know, I, I expect there'd be at least sort of three or four in the in the top twenty. And of course, that's not what's come to pass. But what I think is interesting is the spin that you know Maori should celebrate because Labour um, will have the largest Maori caucus. Um, ever, you know, a third, a third Maori, a, a, a third is, is Maori. Yep. But I, I think. They need to be careful about how they spin that because it appears that they could be playing into the Māori Party narrative, which is that Labour takes the Māori seats and the Māori vote for granted. And if you're mm. if you're counting your votes before they've been cast, um, it, it could appear that way. So I, I got a tweet from someone the other day saying, "Why aren't you should be celeb? I can't understand why you're not celebrating this." Well, traditionally the celebrations are after the election, not before, so. You're laughing, Ben. Yeah. You think this is funny? I thought that was a good line. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, in terms of the effective list, um, because of the high number of Māori who are in winnable or safe bet seats for Labour, they, you know, the expectation, barring disaster, is that they will have a very high proportion of Māori in the, the caucus after the election. So I, I don't necessarily think there was any huge betrayal there. The The Labour Party was obviously balancing a lot of things. Um, they had their gender quota um, that they had to meet, um, which they probably, I think, surprised a few people, including me, by actually um, making a good fist of. Um, you know, they, they managed to successfully kind of shunt these dinosaurs like Trevor Mallard further down the list than I think a lot of people expected. Um, you know, overall, it was a pretty good list. Um, and I think you do have to look at the effective list. You know, who's going to be there almost certainly as a result of seats, and that's a number of the Māori electorate MPs. Um, it's guys like Paul, e uh, Paul Eagle in um, uh, Rongatai. Um, and, you know, so they will have you know, pretty significant representation. I don't think it was quite the snub. I think the issue, the snub that it was portrayed as, on the other hand, you know, it all does flow back from that decision for the by the Māori uh, MPs to to voluntarily uh, yeah. remove yeah. remove themselves for, from the list. Um, mm, I mean, there's some good things like for Pacific um, Pacific Island candidates in the top 20, which is a wonderful win for their community, and there is a, a there is a large number of women. But uh, you know, I guess the question is is would you allow all of your women in safe seats to come off the list and then not have any women in the top 15? Um, and it's about perception, and I don't think that the perception is... Uh, I can understand why Māori are concerned about um, the value that's placed on Māori voters when there are no Māori in their top 15. And in terms of the overall issue of equity, like there is a gender balance and, you know, minority groups and all of that. But um, they seem to have done it really well, except when it comes to Māori, and I just don't understand why you couldn't have someone like Willow Jean Prime and Kitty Tapu Allen, who are women and Māori, further up the list. 
Um, a slightly separate thing is the sort of political management of it all. And having announced, having 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 trailed the announcement of the list on the Monday morning, then having to delay it, and everyone focused on this while the government was under pressure over Pike River at the time, and then more recently, Andrew Little struggling to articulate a position on charter schools, given that Willie Jackson runs a charter school. I mean, is the is is Andrew Little and the Labour Party management overall? been exposed a bit in, in both of those episodes, do you guys think? Well, I listened to um, Scotty Campbell this morning on RNZ and I think he kind of nailed it, which is that if Labour are trying to confuse Māori voters about what, what they stand for, they're doing an excellent job because you have someone like Calvin Davis who, in my opinion, has been one of the most effective opposition MPs that we've seen in a long time mm. um, in one of the toughest portfolios on corrections who's you know, mooting the idea of, of Māori prisons, kaupapa Māori prisons, and then you have Andrew come out and basically shoot it down. Likewise, Willie and the charter schools issue, or, you know, if you remember, I think it was last year when Penny and Calvin got raked over the coals by Andrew for attending a fundraiser for a um, for a charter school, but then he um, headhunts Willie and recruits him into the party who runs a charter school, and now I kind of have no idea where exactly we are on charter schools. So I, I think, yeah, Labor needs to be perhaps a bit more mindful of how some of these messages are translating into the community. In terms of the list announcement, Labour faces challenges that some of the other parties don't have, in that they have this sort of central committee that gathers over a weekend, and they all sort of bid and compete and jostle to get their chosen candidates kind of in, into, into winnable places. And there's winners and losers from that process. But what it also means is that there's a huge number of people who actually know what the list is, is you know, while it's being decided, um, which you don't have, you know, in these much more sort of um, centralised um, processes for other parties. So that means that you know the clock starts ticking as soon as they kind of call it a day at 5 p.m. or whatever, and things start to leak out, like the fact that Willie Jackson was at 21 and was none too happy about that. Um, I think Labor did a pretty good job of tidying it up. It was only one day. And then they had Willie out there, you know, talking about how incredibly happy he was and, you know, exchanging barbs and insults with Paddy Gow, which is probably good for both of their brands. So the, I, 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 don't think this was a, I don't think this was a big failure or hiccup for Labour at all um, in terms of the list announcement. Um, in contrast, I think the charter schools thing, um, it shows that Labour is all at sea on this. Um, Labour's official position is that they won't start any new charter schools, but they'll kind of grandparent the ones that currently exist. And, you know, as, as Penny Hinato said, if, if something's working, why would you change it? And conversely, if something is so terrible that you don't want it to ever start in your, your country again, you know, why would you maintain these things? I just thought on a, listening to... Um, <clears throat> listening to Morning Report, whenever it was, yesterday when um, Andrew Little was on with Susie Ferguson and his attempts to get away from the question of will you close these charter schools just seemed to me surprisingly terrible. Like, he just, he just, is, he, he, he was so far away from answering the question and failed even to come up with one of those kind of routine bridging mechanisms which was I'm not going to announce a uh, policy on the hoof or mm -hmm. this is well, this is there are details we'll need to iron out or even the Winstonian I know you want this to be a big fight on national radio but I'm not going to give you that blah blah then I will what, what New Zealanders do want blah 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 it seems to me that he just drew more attention to the confusion around it by apparently answering a totally different question over and over again well La Labour have always been starkly opposed to charter schools and the reason for that is probably the influence of the teacher unions. Um, as my colleague Matthew Hooden says, not every town in New Zealand has a McDonald's or a warehouse but they all have a branch of the NZEI um, and, and that means they're, it's a tough opponent for a government to take on and they're extremely influential in the Labour Party. So Little can't kind of afford to prevaricate uh, or, or even be ambiguous with his own party about this. He can't give an inch on it. You mean, yeah, so that's right. right. But, but at the same time, he can't be in open warfare with Willie Jackson, who's not going to put at risk 
any of the any of the projects that he's developing in in Auckland um, as a result of an election campaign. Um, when you mentioned Matthew Hood, and I forgot to mention you're from Exaltium Communications. Hello, Ben. Hello. Welcome to a by lunchtime. And Annabelle Lee, you're from the Hui. When you mentioned uh, Mihi earlier, uh, yeah, you were referring to her hosting the Hui, which is a television right. program that you EP. Uh, <clears throat> effortlessly um, segueing into this very last weekend, you had one Winston Peters on your show. We did indeed. He also appeared on The Nation on Q&A. He was on Morning Report this week. The and project. He's, he was, was he on the project he as well, was he? Was the project, yeah. Wow. So he's really bursting out of the blocks yeah. and um, it feels like we're underway properly, right? Mm. Yeah. The triennial bloom of Winston Peters. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny because I spent weeks sort of sending emails to his press secretary and when I finally got her to agree, I was like, yes! Fist pumping, <laughs> right. thinking I was awesome. Right. And then about two days later, he was on the project and then he was on our f- cousins over at The Nation and Q&A and I was like, oh, I'm not quite so special. But um, as Winston says, he lives in the far north. He's a busy man. He's got mm. stuff to do mm. in the weekends. Mm. Those fish don't catch themselves, right. Toby. So um, <laughs> he prefers to knock them, knock a whole lot of birds off with, with one stone. And how did he do? How did he do, do you think? Oh, he's, you know, he's been in Parliament since 1978. Mm. So I think he's pretty remarkable, to be fair. Ben? I didn't yeah. watch him on Q&A, so I can't comment, but he was great with us. On the Q&A, he was, he was <laughs> sort of, he, 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 he walked all over poor old Corin Dan, who's a, who's, a, who's a tremendously good interviewer, but... Um, uh, Winston did his old trick, and then he did the, the, his thing at the end. He was, he was so furious the whole time, just furious and just fulminating. And then at the end, he goes, <laughs> you know, and it's that kind of everything is just oh, no, 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 out of character. He, en- he enjoys the sport of it, but no, he was um, delightful, wasn't mm, he? Mm. What, was, what was the what was the subject? Uh, we talked about. We started off talking about. Um, immigration mm. and how it affects his constituents in Northland. He has a high population of Māori who are very low income and um, and don't have um, qualifications. So he talked about the impact on them. He talked about Te Ture Whenua Māori um, and the rela- uh, our relationship with Australia. And then we asked him who he thought would be the first Māori Prime Minister and he reminded us that there has already been two. Um, Sir James Carroll, and of course, uh, the Right Honourable Winston Peters. <laughs> Ish. <laughs> um, ben, did you did you watch the Winston Peters show over the weekend? I, I only only caught a bit of the um, a bit of the flurry. It's sort of like um, standing on Tamaki Drive during a storm. Um, I think into you know what Annabelle was saying about his incredible longevity. You know, forty years in Parliament almost. Um, it probably helps that he manages to have a rest day now and then, yeah. i.e. for the three years between elections. Um, but he really knows how to time his run. He's and tabled tabled a lot of documents in Parliament <laughs> in the interim, have you know, <laughs> a lot of documents. He, um, yeah, look, I mean, he's timing his run consummately as he always does. Um, I, th- I think we've barely even gotten started, um, and he's signalled that he's really going to ratchet up the rhetoric from the the last election campaign. Um, I think I've described this as his greatest hits tour. So we're going to get Asian immigration from 1996. He's already started rattling that off. Um, we can't be far away from the Muslim viper threat of 2005. Uh, refugees, I think, will probably be on the agenda. Um, he's been talking about, you know, the, the you know cr- crime and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think what's actually what I find interesting is that this year he's actually departed a little from the playbook and that he's actually started attacking, he's, he's combined his two favourite topics of immigrants and railing against the media yeah. to attack foreign-born journalists. Mm. Yeah, that was, um, pretty, that was pretty disgraceful. It was, it, it, was, it was very, it was disgraceful, it was very cynical and it was very effective. It, you got him on one news, um, yeah. 
because journalists will always will always respond to attacks, um, and 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 that that gives them more light. It's more such limelight. a tricky area that though, because um, Bill English was very careful, and I think possibly Andrew Little as well, not to call it racist. You know, yeah. not to call him racist, and then and we have. You know, seasoned practitioners like Rob Hosking, who's terrific, but saying, oh, you're falling in right into his trap. This is what he wanted, condemning him for racism. Silly commentators. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but what are, you, what are you to do? Do you instead go, oh, well, just, just, just let him get on with his crazy little Uncle Winston racism, you know? No, I mean, that, what, that's what, right. What, it's, uh, it what is, do you do? It is very similar to the Trump campaign where, you know, he, he can proceed to do more and more outrageous things and you either implicitly condone it with silence or you draw more attention to you it by attempting, it. To, yeah. by attempting to, um, to, to challenge it. Now, I think, that the, <laughs> I, th I, th I think that right now our politicians are definitely on the side of trying to um, dampen the flames by not giving it oxygen, which also dovetails nicely with their strategic objective of not alienating Winston before the election mm. because the chances are either Labour or National will need him to form a government. So um, we could put uh, their, their kind of um, mute, muted response to this kind of thing down to um, Kenny political strategy or to cravenness, and I yeah. think both play a part. Do you think there's a line beyond which... Is there a line, Annabelle, that... Uh, Winston could cross where one of the main parties would say, actually, you know what, or the Greens, for that matter, would say, actually, you know what, we don't want to, we don't want to have a bar of this. Do what John Key did in mm -hmm. 2000 and... La, 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 2008. 2008, was it? Yep. And rule them out. I don't think so. No. Perhaps the Greens, but, um, but I, I don't believe Labour or, or National will find themselves, um, will, will have that luxury this election, I imagine. And Winston has also promised that he will stick on the helmet and the flashlight and go into Pike River Mine. Um, that story... And pinstripe overalls. <laughs> that story... That story... Um, the little hammer, you know, just... Tip, 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 tip. That story re-emerged when... <laughs> hey, hey... Um, I can't. I can't describe what Annabelle's. I mean, he's he's very busy in Northland. I, I imagine he'd he'd sent in a few list MPs first just to make sure it was safe. It's not a funny story. No. Uh, TV three broadcast some footage which uh, we don't think had been screened before. Maybe parts of it had, which um, showed um, a couple of people at the one end of the entry part of the drift and a robot, and the robot didn't emitting some steam or smoke which didn't create a flame and it returned that subject to the foreground Ben is Pike River a live campaign issue going into the election is it is it is it is it going to be a problem for Bill English I don't like to talk about Pike River in terms of you know political optics um, because I think too many people have kind of you know diverted it into that kind of area. Sure. Um, I think that the opposition parties are wrong when they say that there's some kind of government cover-up or that the government's forgotten about the families. Um, I did a bit of work um, involving Pike River and the Royal Commission, and so I've, I've been down to Greymouth, you know, had meetings, that sort of thing. And I don't think that anyone, you know, the, what's for, first and foremost with everyone in government, and I know people who are dealing with it now, is always, you know, the feelings of the family... And, and bearing in mind, you know, what they went through, um, you know, on that day and subsequently. And I think it's a little calculated and cynical of opposition parties to try and sort of paint this as an unfeeling government, you know, that just kind of wants to sweep things under the carpet and, and keep going. I don't think there's any reason to doubt Bill English's um, advice that, or, or, or his, his belief in the advice that it's too dangerous to go into the mine. Um, you know, there's not, there's not really anything in the drift as I understand it, um, you know, whether you can go 400 metres and 600 metres and whatever. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I feel very uncomfortable about the whole thing because I think it just sort of exacerbates and kind of keeps the sort of false hope alive um, for the families to kind of continue campaigning on this. But the experts say that you could have a possible re-entry, so I guess as long as you have a group of what appears to be highly knowledgeable people that say a re-entry is possible, there's always going to be those lingering doubts 
for families. And I think the very least that they're owed is um, is all of the information that's at hand, and that includes the unedited versions of whatever videos have been made. And I thought it was interesting listening to Checkpoint the other night when they said they'd put in an, an urgent OIA request to find out who had decided which parts of the um, video should be edited and presented and that information um, doesn't actually exist. So I still think there's a lot more questions to be answered yeah. um, about the Pike River issue. And um, I don't know if it will make or break the election, but I think it'll stay on the agenda and it should because, you know, a huge number of um, of men died that day. Mm. And that's right, you, as you point out, that, that footage came to light because it was leaked. That's right. Um, and it shouldn't have to come by that method, should it? No. The Winston as well was um, featured in The Ninth Floor, which was the RNZ series that was a bit of a hit, sort of podcast video series with the, the ex-Prime Ministers, except John Key and the ones that are dead, um, interviewed by Guy and Espiner in long-form interviews. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, Winston... It was floated with Helen Clark in the last one that Winston um, uh, might have sought the Prime Ministership as part of coalition negotiations um, way back when. What year was that? Uh, 96. 96. And, uh, and Helen Clark said that it hadn't been raised with her directly but it may, by Winston, but some of his people might have, blah, blah, blah. And that, is that still a live possibility in coalition negotiations, do you guys think? Uh, Winston Peters, Prime Minister... You know, the, 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 the theory of Winston Peters gets Prime Minister for three months as a kind of... Didn't he rule that out on The Nation on the weekend? I thought he said that. I thought Lisa asked him that and he said no. I don't know if He's, he, he said no say. a lot in yeah. his career. <laughs> you don't necessarily <laughs> rely on that. It's like the... It's, I mean, Andrew Giddis wrote a, wrote a piece for us some time ago saying it's the sort of Borgin theory whereby the, the Prime Minister doesn't have to come from the, the largest party. Yeah, well, that, well, that's right. As, as per a piece published on the spin-off um, this week, you know, there's no such thing as an elected prime minister in New Zealand. Oh um, yeah, that piece. That's and 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 particularly within an MMP environment, it's very difficult to say the public has called for this person to be prime minister. So I mean, constitutionally, it would be fine. In terms of political reality, there's absolutely no way <laughs> at all that a Labour caucus or a National caucus would accept Winston Peters being their Prime Minister. Um, so whatever kind of was arranged, you know, this is where you'd get into a situation where, um, you know, Jenny Shipley rolled Jim Bolger, and a huge part of that was because of dissatisfaction with, you know, New Zealand First um, junior ministers and ministers kind of running around telling National backbenchers what to do. Can I just say that reminds me of the article on the spin-off this week about Jenny Shipley and, you know, does it does it or does it not matter that whether or not she was the first... Is she the first Prime Minister yeah. or not, given that she wasn't the first elected woman Prime Minister? Does it matter? I think so. I think it does, yeah. I think it was a fair thing for them to point out that she is not the first elected Prime Minister. Um. The other issue that came up in that last Helen Clark, the last episode of the Ninth Floor with Helen Clark, was the foreshore and seabed stuff, where Helen Clark is sticking by her guns on that, saying I think she said no regrets on it, um, uh, which is which is unlike the position that's taken by the likes of Andrew Little and Jacinda Ardern now, who uh, at very least say that it was a mistake. Mm. Um, ben, it's also been back in the news after a case has been taken, uh, a fresh case of Forshire and Seabed, and it's, um, you worked on this a bit, you wrote a piece on the spin-off too, since we're just basically doing <laughs> advertorial for the spin-off website here, um, but you were, you were a bit um, pissed off about all that. Yeah, so what happened is um, Helen Clark's government passed in 2004 the Forshire and Seabed Act, which nationalised the entire Forshore and Seabed of New Zealand, which is the seabed out to 12 kilometres and up to the high tide mark. Um, the national government, with the support of the Māori Party, repealed that and restored the right of Māori to seek customary title over 
parts of the foreshore and seabed where they could prove that they had basically been using it as if they owned it in a customary way, uh, according with their traditions for, you know, since 1840. Which is incredibly high thresholds. Um, <clears throat> they, they, they are high thresholds because, yeah, you've, you've essentially got to prove and, and there would have been, yeah, anyway. Um, six, that was six years ago. There was a six year time frame for people lodging applications to either the court or the government for direct negotiations to demonstrate, to have their customary title recognised. Um, and that deadline has just passed. Manu Paul, who is a former chairman of the New Zealand Māori Council, um, d disagreed with the time frame. He thought that people should have been given, you know, longer to get their applications together. So as a kind of media stunt or protest, he lodged he's lodged a claim to the entire foreshore and seabed on behalf of all Māori. Now this is obviously impossible. He he doesn't have a right to represent all Māori. He can't claim, you know, their customary rights you know, on their behalf. Um, but it did get a lot of media attention and it kind of stirred up all of the usual suspects. Um, the, 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 the ghost of Don Brash rattling chains and grasping a copy of, you know, the, the original English version of the treaty um, reappeared to, to warn us direly of what would happen if, um, if Māori ever did get customary title recognised in the foreshore and seabed um, and conveniently neglected to note that they already have the first decision was actually made last year, just before Christmas, um, in a remote group of islands uh, off Stewart Island, the TT Islands, where mutton birds were traditionally harvested. And weirdly enough, the world didn't end. Nobody took to the streets with signs saying, you know, whites have rights too, or whatever happened back in the early 2000s, um, because this was never <laughs> the giant um, scare um, that it was, it was promoted as. Mm. You know, customary title exists all are, will exist, I think, we'll find all around New Zealand. Um, but it won't draw a lot of media attention because where people will be able to prove that they have customary title, you know, going back to 1840, um, will be areas that, by definition, the public hasn't visited, that there aren't, you know, that haven't been taken into crown ownership, that there aren't ports built on. It'll be beaches that adjoin private coastal land. Um, you know, if, if you go on holiday up north, there's plenty of places where, you know, you've got to ask the owners if you want to go over to their beach. That's, you know, that, that won't change at all. Um, and, and people have always, I think, you know, recognised that, you know, there's a sort of kaitiaki sort of relationship um, in, you know, certain parts of the coast, um, you know, that you've just got to pay a bit of notice to. I don't think it's a bad thing what Manu Paul has done. I think it's helped raise awareness of the issue again and, get people questioning why there was a deadline in the first place. But um, in Te Ao Māori it is still very much a live issue and you, for example we've got a story on in a couple of weeks about um, Ngāraudu in Taranaki um, who are currently fighting a proposal um, of a mining company who want to come in and extract ore from the seabed um, but it's a place where um, blue whales um, eat and, you know, they are a, an iwi that relies a lot on their kaimoana mm. um, and it's obviously going to have a dramatic impact on them and I think it's important that New Zealanders remember it, it wasn't, you know, um, there's some bigger issues at play with the foreshore and seabed and environmental protection from those sorts of um, mining companies is, is one of them. Let's um, finish with uh, the offshore uh, minister, as it were, Jerry Brownlee, who's been in the role for 20 minutes and already managed to create a couple of minor kerfuffles in the form of uh, trying to deal with Australia's latest uh, assault on hard-working New Zealanders living in Australia by removing their... Or, 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 or taking away their student fee benefits. Is that the right way to put it? Hiking up their student loans. That's a better way to put it, thank you. Um, and then, to my mind, more importantly, uh, saying s some rather ill-judged things about the UN resolution around Israeli settlements where he more or less on the hoof uh, suggested pretty much explicitly that Jerry, that his predecessor, Murray McCulley, had gone too far in supporting the, the um, UN resolution. Unbelievable. Murray McCulley had just finished negotiating peace in the Middle East, and then Jerry goes in. 
and screws it all up. Yeah, right on the brink. <laughs> right on the brink. I, I, you're going to defend Jerry Brownlee, aren't you? Yeah, look, yeah. I'm, I'm a Brownlee booster. I, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, we've got to get a bit real. You know, we've got to get a bit as, real. As, as, you know, we're 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 a country that punches above our weight. You know, we're a moral leader of the world. Uranium on your breath at all, but in we're re- irrelevant. In in reality, as Jerry Brownlee said. You know, peace in the Middle East will come when the Israel when the when the Israelis and the Palestinians decide that they don't want to kill each other anymore. It won't it won't happen as a result of a resolution at the UN, and it certainly won't happen as a result of you know New Zealand kind of you know creating a new roadmap for peace or whatever it is that Murray McCulley spent his three years on while all of our the rights of New Zealanders in Australia were being taken away. That notwithstanding all of that. It is somewhat alarming when the person who's in charge of the foreign affairs portfolio just suddenly kind of screeches on the handbrake on whether or not you think it's something that New Zealand should have expended a lot of time on. They did. It was, it's not yeah. some minor yeah. detail. It's also fucking Israel-Palestine, which is, you know, the, of the last 50 years, probably the mainstay hot, hot spot in international relations. It seemed quite surprising that he would... And then, and then Bill English gave in his press conference to his kind of gentle vicar, well, you know, you need to understand the <laughs> diplomacy, words matter. You know, and it's kind of... And then Jerry Brownlee, what's more, went and said, oh, yes, I'm going to learn my lessons. The people at MFAT are teaching. It's like, what the fuck is going on here? You can't be foreign minister and then go and take a lesson in the basics of diplomacy. You can't go to UN with your L plates on, can you? You can't go to the UN with your L plates on. I think, um, personally... He appears to be way out of his depth, and you just can't have people bumbling and issues of that greater magnitude. He's going to be all right, though, isn't he? You brownly boosting Ben. I, th- <laughs> I have a lot of confidence in Jerry. Yeah, I um. Because yeah. look at the magnificent job he did with Christchurch. Like, how could Ben not have confidence? Well, he's different. Did a lot of different views on on that. I mean, you know, in, in, in terms of his 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 performance and. His electoral performance has been really strong. And yeah, the Christchurch went from being a Labour city to a national city in the in the teeth of the greatest disaster it ever faced. And I think Brownlee critics, you know, have to contend with that that maybe they don't represent all people in Christchurch. Seriously, he's got to be on a bit of a short leash now. And you would think that. Uh, I mean, given that, I mean, clearly he's a very I mean, smart maybe, guy. Maybe, maybe but he may have a few temperament issues, right? Um, he, he, you don't necessarily want as your foreign minister someone who always speaks their mind. <laughs> Mind you, the Foreign Secretary of Britain is Boris Johnson, so, you know, what, who knows what's going on in the world, really. I mean, I mean, this is a broader point, actually, that um, nine years into a government, everyone, um, politicians, staffers, are kind of getting shifted around in this less institutional knowledge. Um, you know, so, some of the sort of arcane details like words matter, um, might might go awry, astray, um, you know. Pe- pe- the, the, there isn't that same sort of level of understanding of how you know. We, we, when you get kind of you know late, late in the piece and people are just being kind of moved around like chess pieces, um, you know, as distinct from say at the beginning of the government, Tony Ryle would spend say five years as health spokesman, and sure. then he becomes the health minister. Then after that. You know, his replacement, Jonathan Coleman, has not spent nearly as much... I mean, he's a doctor, but he's spent n- nowhere near as much time, you know, understanding the system. Um, and and so I, th- I think there is a potential for, you know, these kind of mishaps to happen, you know, as governments get older. Um, but I, I don't think it's a huge thing. Jerry will find his feet. How do you think, um, both of you, that... Um Everything is looking. How, what did we say? One hundred and forty. What? How many days? Fifty nine. Where? Where? What's the? What? Stick your finger up into the weather, and how's it? How's it? How's it faring ahead of the election? Well, I, I think key resigning hasn't been the catastrophe that many of us thought it would be, and English seems to be sort of quietly trucking yep. along, and yep. and you know you have big issues like Pike River come up that you know we're um, seemingly Labour should be able to get some runs on the board, but then, you know, they'll have a kerfuffle over their list and it all seems to um, go away again. So he's um, he's looking unrattled so far, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, kind of going back to the ninth floor thing, you know, where you see this sort of, you know, 
political big beasts, you know, like Clark, like, um, well, I think Clark is definitely the most, and Bolger, I think, you know, the real heavyweights that were interviewed as part of that series. And well, they're, they're only ones that, they were the only ones that were Prime Minister for more than fleeting moments. Yeah, yeah that's Jenny right. And, company, but, but, and, and both all really successful, you know, three, three elections each. And I, you don't really get the same sort of sense of kind of scale and grandeur of English versus Little, do you? It's it's mm. um, it's it's not the same kind of clash that Key versus Clark was, mm. where you really had two compelling political figures yeah. at the top of their games. Yeah. You know, maybe Clark a little bit in decline from our heyday, but you know that was sort of that was kind of rumble in the jungle stuff. Mm. You know, here we're kind of Joseph Parker at the Victor Arena. Which which would make mean that the the path was pretty open to someone like Winston Peters. So let's talk about him. No, let's not. Uh, that's gone by lunchtime. Thank you very much, Anna Willey. Thank you very much, Ben Thomas. Thank you, Madeline Chapman. Uh, we'll be back in a bit. I'm Toby Manhire, and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up a total election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards the <laughs> There's radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spinner. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spinoff member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz/donate. The Spinoff Podcast Network.